ಶ್ರೀಮತಿ ಜಯಲಕ್ಷ್ಮಿ ರಾಮಚಂದ್ರನ್ ಮತ್ತು ಕೆ ಆರ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಅವರ ನೆನಪಿನ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮ ಇದು ನಮ್ಮೆಲ್ಲರಿಗೂ ಇವತ್ತಿನ ಮುಖ್ಯ ಭಾಷಣಕಾರರ ಪರಿಚಯ ಇದ್ದೇ ಇದೆ ಅವರ ಸಣ್ಣ ಪರಿಚಯದಕ್ಕೆ ಮುಂಚೆ ಒಂದು ಸಣ್ಣ ಪ್ರಾರ್ಥನೆ ಪ್ರಾರ್ಥನೆಯ ನಂತರ ಒಂದು ಎರಡು ನಿಮಿಷದ ಅವರ ಪರಿಚಯ ಆಮೇಲೆ ಅವರು ಮಾತನ್ನು ಮುಂದುವರಿಸ್ತಾರೆ ಪಂಡಿತರು ಒಬ್ಬ ಗುರುಗಳಾಗಿ ಮತ್ತು ಸಂಗ್ಯಾಸತ್ವದ ಹಾದಿನಲ್ಲಿ 
ರಂಗಪ್ರಿಯ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿಗಳಾಗ್ಬಿಡ್ತಾರೆ ಆ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿಗಳಾದ ಮೇಲೂ ಆ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿಗೆ ಅವರ ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಒಡನಾಟ ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಆಗ ಒಂದು ದಿನ ಆ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿ ಅವರನ್ನ ಕುತೂಹಲ ಸಹಜ ಕುತೂಹಲವಾಗಿ ಒಂದು ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆ ಕೇಳ್ತಾರೆ ಬೆಳಿಗ್ಗೆ ನೀವು ಎಷ್ಟೊತ್ತು ಬಿದ್ದೊಳ್ತೀರ ತೀರ ಸಣ್ಣ ಘಟನೆ ಆದ್ರೆ ಅದೊಂದು ಅದ್ಭುತವಾದಂತಹ ಪರಿಣಾಮವನ್ನ ಆ ಹುಡುಗನಲ್ಲಿ ಮಾರ್ಪಾಡನ್ನ ತಗುತ್ತೆ ಅವ್ರು ಕೇಳ್ತಾನೆ ಅವ್ರಿಗ ನೀವು ಎಷ್ಟೊತ್ತು ಗೆದ್ದೊಳ್ತೀರಾ ಅಂತಂದಾಗ ನಾನು ಬೆಳಿಗ್ಗೆ ಮೂರುವರೆಗೆ ಗೆದ್ದೊಳ್ತೀನಪ್ಪ ನಾನು ಧ್ಯಾನ ಮಾಡ್ತೀನಿ ಅಂತ ಅವ್ರು ಹೇಳ್ತಾರೆ ಆದರೆ ಈ ಹುಡುಗನಿಗೆ ಮಾಮೂಲಿ ಸಾಮಾನ್ಯ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿಗಳಿಗೆಲ್ಲ ಕುತೂಹಲ ಇರುತ್ತಲ್ಲ ಹೇಳಿದ್ದನ್ನೇ ಮಾಡ್ತಾರೋ ಇಲ್ವೋ ನೋಡಬೇಕು ಅನ್ನೋ ಒಂದು ಕುತೂಹಲ ಇದೇ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಇಲ್ಲೇ ಅಂದರೆ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಡೇ ಹೋಗಿ ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆ ಮಾಡ್ಬೋದಲ್ಲ ಗುರುಗಳನ್ನ ಬೆಳೆ ಚಹ ನಾನು ನಾನು ನೋಡಿದ್ವಿ ನೀವು ಬರಲೇ ಇಲ್ಲ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಮೂರುವರೆ ಅಂದರೆ ನೀವು ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಇರಲೇ ಇಲ್ಲ ಅಂತೆಲ್ಲ ನಾವು ರೋಪ್ ಹಾಕ್ಬೋದಲ್ಲ ಟೀಚರ್ ಮೇಲೆ ಅದಕ್ಕೊಂದು ಅವಕಾಶ ಸಿಗ್ಬೋದು ಅನ್ನೋದು ಒಂದು ಕುತೂಹಲ ಸಹಜ ಕುತೂಹಲ ಒಂದು ಜೊತೆಗೆ ನಿಜಕ್ಕೂ ಆ ವ್ಯಕ್ತಿ ಆ ರೀತಿ ಇರ್ತಾರ ಅಂತ ನೋಡಬೇಕು ಅನ್ನೋದಕ್ಕೋಸ್ಕರ ಆ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿ ಬೆಳಗಿನ ಜನ ಮೂರುವರೆಗೆ ಅವ್ರ ಮನೆ ಮುಂದೆ ಹೋಗ್ತಾರೆ ಹೋಗಿ ನಿಂತು ನೋಡಿದಾಗ ಮೂರುವರೆಗೆ ಅವ್ರ ಮನೇಲಿ ಲೈಟ್ ಆನ್ ಆಗಿರುತ್ತೆ ಅದು ಅವರಿಗೆ ಜೀವನದಲ್ಲಿ ಆ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿಗೆ ಅತ್ಯಂತ ಪ್ರಭಾವಿ ಆಗಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂತಹ ಒಂದು ಪಾಠವನ್ನ ಹೇಳ್ಕೊಡುತ್ತೆ ಹೇಳಿದ್ದನ್ನಷ್ಟೇ ಅಲ್ಲ ಮಾಡಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಮಾಡುವಂತಹದನ್ನೇ ಹೇಳಬೇಕು ಅನ್ನುವಂತಹ ಒಂದು ಪರಿಕಲ್ಪನೆಯನ್ನ ಆ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಹುಟ್ಟಾಕತ್ತೆ ಆ ವಿದ್ಯಾರ್ಥಿ ಮುಂದೆ ಬೆಳೀತಾ ಪ್ರಸ್ತುತವಾಗಿ ಮದ್ರಾಸ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಟೆಕ್ನಾಲಜಿಯ ಚೇರ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಆಗಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಮತ್ತು ಲಿಸ್ಟ್ ನ ಓದೋ ಅಷ್ಟು ಸಮಯವೇ ಇಲ್ಲ ಅಷ್ಟೊಂದು ಅವರ ಸಾಧನೆಗಳಿದೆ ಅವಾರ್ಡ್ಗಳಿರ್ಬೋದು ಅಥವಾ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕೇಶನ್ಸ್ ಇರ್ಬೋದು ಜೊತೆಗೆ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ಲೇಷನ್ಸ್ ಮಾಡಿರ್ತಕ್ಕಂಥದ್ದು ಇರ್ಬೋದು ಅವರ ಭಾಷಣಗಳು ಕೂಡ ಬರೀ ದೇಶದಲ್ಲಿ ಅಷ್ಟೇ ಅಲ್ಲ ವಿದೇಶಗಳಲ್ಲೂ ಕೂಡ ಅತ್ಯಂತ ಪ್ರಭಾವಿಯಾಗಿ ಮಾರ್ಪಾಟ್ಗಳನ್ನು ತಂದಿವೆ ಕೇವಲ ನಾಲ್ಕನ್ನು ಮಾತ್ರ ನಿಮ್ಗೆ ಗಮನಕ್ಕೆ ತರ್ತೀನಿ ನಾಮಿನೇಟೆಡ್ ಆಸ್ ಮೆಂಬರ್ ಅಕಾಡೆಮಿಕ್ ಕೌನ್ಸಿಲ್ ಅಟ್ ವೇದ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನ ಸೋ ಸೌಧ ಚೆನ್ನೈನಹಳ್ಳಿಯಲ್ಲಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅದಲ್ಲದೆ ಎರಡ್ ಸಾವಿರದ ಹತ್ತೊಂಬತ್ತರಲ್ಲಿ ಕಾನ್ಫರ್ಡ್ ಡೆಲಿಟ್ ಆನ್ ಏರಿಯಸ್ ಕಾಸ್ ಬೈ ರಾಷ್ಟ್ರೀಯ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತಿ ಸಂಸ್ಕೃತ್ ವಿದ್ಯಾಪೀಠ ತಿರುಪತಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಅವರಿಗೆ ಒಂದು ಡೆಲಿಟ್ ಪದವಿಯನ್ನು ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದೆ ಹಾಗೆ ಸೀನಿಯರ್ ಫೆಲೋ ಇಂಡಿಯನ್ ಕೌನ್ಸಿಲ್ ಫಾರ್ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಸೈನ್ಸ್ ರಿಸರ್ಚ್ ಐ ಸಿ ಎಸ್ ಎಸ್ ಆರ್ ಅಂತ ನಾವೇನು ಕೇಳ್ತೀವಿ ಹಾಗೆಯೇ ವಿದ್ಯಾನಿಧಿ ಎ ಟೈಟಲ್ ಒಂದು ಬಿರುದನ್ನ ಕೊಟ್ಟಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಕನ್ಫರ್ಡ್ ಬೈ ಎಚ್ ಎಸ್ ರಂಗಪ್ರಿಯ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ಅವರ ಯಾರ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ನಾನು ಹೇಳಿದೆ ರಂಗಪ್ರಿಯ ಅಂತ ಅವರೇ ಕೊಟ್ಟಂತಹ ಒಂದು ಬಿರುದು ವಿದ್ಯಾನಿಧಿ ಅಂತ ಅದೊಂದು ಹೆಮ್ಮೆಯ ವಿಚಾರ ಒಬ್ಬ ಗುರು ತನ್ನ ಶಿಷ್ಯನಿಗೆ ಒಂದು ಪದವಿಯನ್ನು ಅಥವಾ ಒಂದು ಪುರಸ್ಕಾರವನ್ನು ಕೊಟ್ಟಾಗ ಅದು ಹೆಚ್ಚು ಹೆಮ್ಮೆ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಅವರು ಇವತ್ತು ನಮ್ಮ ಮಧ್ಯೆ ಕೊಡ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೆ ಎಸ್ ಕಣ್ಣ ಕನ್ನಡದಲ್ಲೂ ಸಹ ವಿರೂಪಾಕ್ಷ ವಸಂತೋತ್ಸವ ಚಂಪು ಧಾತು ರೂಪ ಕೋಶ ಕೃದಂತ ರೂಪ ಕೋಶ ಆಯುರ್ವೇದೀಯ ಸುಧ ಪದಾರ್ಥ ವಿಜ್ಞಾನ ಅನ್ನುವಂತಹ ಪುಸ್ತಕಗಳನ್ನು ಕೂಡ ಅವರು ಅದ ಕಡೆ ಎಲ್ಲ ತಮ್ಮ ಸಾಧನೆ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ವಿಶೇಷವಾಗಿ ನಾನು ಹೇಳಕ್ಕೆ ಇಷ್ಟಪಡೋದು ಈಗಲೂ ಕೂಡ ನಾನು ಎನ್ ಎಂ ಕೆ ಆರ್ ವಿ ಕಾಲೇಜಲ್ಲಿ ಮತ್ತು ಬೇರೆ ಬೇರೆ ಕಾಲೇಜಲ್ಲಿ ಪಾಠ ಮಾಡ್ತೀನಿ ಆದರೆ ಒಂದೊಂದು ಸರ್ತಿ ಏನು ಒಂದು ಎಂಟತ್ತು ವರ್ಷದಿಂದ ಪಾಠ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀರಲ್ಲ ಅದೇ ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಅಕೌಂಟಿಂಗ್ ಅದೇ ಮ್ಯಾನೇಜ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಅಕೌಂಟಿಂಗ್ ಅದೇ ನೀನು ಮತ್ತೆ ಮತ್ತೆ ಪ್ರಾಕ್ಟೀಸ್ ಮಾಡೋ ಅವಶ್ಯಕತೆ ಏನಿದೆ ಹಾಗೆ ಹೋಗಿ ಒಳಗಬಿಡೋಣ ಅಂತ ಒಂದೊಂದು ಸರ್ತಿ ಬೇಜಾರಾದಾಗಲೋ ಸೋಂಬೇರಿ ತಂದಿದ್ದಲೋ ಹಾಗೆ ಹೋಗಿ ಪಾಠ ಮಾಡಿ ಬಂದ್ಬಿಡ್ತೀನಿ ಅಕಸ್ಮಾತ್ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ಯಾವ್ದಾದ್ರು ಪ್ರಶ್ನೆ ಕೇಳಿದಾಗ ಅಯ್ಯೋ ಪ್ರಿಪೇರ್ ಆಗಿದ್ರೆ ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿತ್ತು
including Sanskrita, Pali and Prakrita, Tamil, Greek and Latin, French and German, and many more. He was a thorough master of these languages. And he was also a person who would go to the original sources in these languages and study the texts and quote with authenticity. Generally, it so happens that many people yes. depend upon mere translations. So this was not the case with Anandak Maharaswami. He was able to go to the original sources and speak with authority and authenticity. <clears throat> Even though Kumar Swami wrote on art in general also, a great deal of his focus was on Indian art. Art is a subject about which we often have very vague notions. We think it is all subjective and therefore it is not easy to give definitions, understand and explain the concepts and so on. But not so on the Kumar Swami. Yeah. <clears throat> he was primarily a student of science. He was a geologist and that background of his sound and deep knowledge of science shows itself in all his writings. You can see that he could speak. <laughs> So, as in mathematics, you won't understand the next step without clearly understanding the previous step. On the other hand, those who have not had a background of science and mathematics will speak generally in a vague manner. You can look into the writings of even Dr. S. Radhakrishnan. So, he gives a number of ideas, but that sharpness and precision that you can find in the writings of Ananda Kumar Swami are certainly missing in the writings of Dr. Sadakshtan, though he was a great philosopher and he also had a wide knowledge. <clears throat> I can only touch upon a few points. Art is a vast field, and Kumar Swami has <clears throat> written a good deal of literature on this field and in one of his books called The Dance of Shiva, he writes at one point that there is an intimate relationship between art and yoga and he says that a whole book could be written on the relationship between art and yoga. So this will give you an idea of the vastness of his writing. And in order to know why the ideas of Kumar Swami are important for us, we must first get a picture of the general situation about the reactions to art in India before Ananda Kumar Swami came and after Ananda Kumar Swami. Those of you who have visited Elephanta and Elora caves and so on, you will have seen that there are wonderful sculptures of the various divinities. And what you will also notice, along with the grandeur of those sculptures, is the great tragedy living. Namely, the Dutch and the Portuguese used to use those wonderful sculptures as shooting targets. They would shoot at our divinities and take it as a practice. So that, that way they have destroyed so many of our wonderful sculptures. And you might also note that there is also a roaring business 
a multi-million dollar business of regularly stealing Indian works of art, especially those in our temples. Okay, look at America. The maximum history that it can boast of is about 150 years. But even those pieces, if something is say 80 years old or 100 years old, they preserve it with utmost care. And in our country, we have things which go back to say not just 880, it goes to even BC. So for 2000 years, much more, we have document evidence of Indian art <clears throat> and the literacy itself goes much farther. Now this being the case, we must first know what were the views of many of our own people or Westerners regarding our art. I just give you some samples of the views and stands taken by many of the critics of art. <clears throat> some of these views have been recorded by Dr. Anand Kumar Swami himself. For example, Alfred Maskell, he says of our sculpture, oh, those hideous deities with animals, heads and innumerable arms. So for them, India has had no sense of beauty at all. If a divinity has multiple arms, for them, it all looks as nonsensical. There was one Sir George Birdwood. So he, he died in 1917. He was quite sympathetic to many of the Indian causes. Yet, he said regarding our various gods, the monstrous shapes of the Puranic deities are unsuitable for the higher forms of artistic representation. And this is possibly why sculpture and painting are unknown as fine arts in India. So most of the Western critics would say there is no sense of art at all in India. There was this famous Baden Powell. He said, in a country like India, we must not expect to find anything that appeals to mind or deep feeling. So they, they totally discount any possibility of the existence or evolution of good or great art in our country. Vincent Smith, the most famous historian of India, he says, Indian sculpture properly so called hardly deserves to be reckoned as art. The figures of both men and animals become stiff and formal and the idea of power is clumsily expressed by the multiplication of members, that is hands, etc. The many-headed, many-armed gods and goddesses whose images crowd the walls and roofs of medieval temples have no pretensions to beauty, which means they come nowhere near being called beautiful and are frequently hideous and grotesque. So such were the kinds of judgments that were passed regarding excellent pieces of Indian art. What then was the contribution of Kumar Swami? In order to know the contribution of Kumar Swami, if we look at some of the words of praise that were showered upon on the Kumar Swami, we will get to know. One of the famous statements is of Eric Gilly. He wants to make a list of the wonderful achievements of Ananda Kumar Swami. He says, others have written on the truth about life and religion and man's work. So he, he mentions a number of specializations. There are many scholars who have specialized in these individual fields. But it is in Kumar Swami that you can find the multiple, see, mastery of multiple fields. So others have written good and clear English. Kumar Swami's English is known as one of the best, and he is known as the one of the best English writers. Others have had the gift of witty exposition. Others have understood the metaphysics of 
Christianity, and others have understood the metaphysics of Hinduism and Buddhism. Others have understood the true significance of erotic drawings and sculptures. Others have seen the relationships of the true and the good and the beautiful. Others have had apparently unlimited learning. Others have loved, others have been kind and generous. But I know of no one else in whom all these gifts and all these powers have been combined. I dare not confess myself his disciple. That would only embarrass him. I can only say that I believe that no other living writer has written the truth in the matters of art and life and religion and piety with such wisdom and understanding. So, such words of praise were uttered regarding the multiple facets of the genius called Anandakumar Swami. <clears throat> On the value of the work done by Kumar Swami, David Smith, a recent writer, says, Kumar Swami's training as a scientist along with his scholarly attainments enabled him to make a statement regarding the dance of Shiva that has reverberated through the 20th century. Another person who is a Dravidian scholar by name Zulebi, he says, Kumar Swami's, he refers to Kumar Swami's tremendous intuition through which he grasped the philosophical essence of Shiva's dance and even in some seemingly minor point, he foresaw the results of later research. So, the impact of Anand Kumar Swami's work is that Rodin, the famous French sculptor, he came to respect the dancing Shiva of Chidambaram. He compares this to the famous Medici Venus, and as indeed their gestures can compare in gracefulness and elegance. And William Dalrymple, who has written numerous works you know, of travel on India, he speaks of Nataraja as the ultimate Chola icon endowed with both a raw sensual power and a profound theological message. <clears throat> These are only um, some words of praise that I have spoken of Anandakumar Swami's great work. Anandakumar Swami was born in 1877 and he died some two months after India got independence. And in the last 20 years of his life, he did tremendous work going to the depths of Indian art and art in general itself. He studied geology in England and was posted as a geologist in Ceylon. And the first thing that he noticed was so many arts and handicrafts of Ceylon were being systematically destroyed by the British and therefore he wanted to start a society for the protection of local arts and handicrafts. With this began his journey of going deep into every field that he studied. He was a master of over a dozen fields and this took him to the study of art in India as a whole and even Indonesia. He has written a wonderful work called History of Indian and Indonesian Art and Architecture. It's a masterpiece of the work and he was one of the pioneers at a time when even foreigners had not done much work in the field or given only distorted presentations of Indian art. Kumar Swami was a pioneer who made a very deep study of Indian art and showed the value of Indian art to the outside world. Today I will speak only on a few aspects of Kumar Swami's contributions and the philosophical insights that are provided in the writings of Ananda Kumar Swami. Now, the, the study of art is known by the term aesthetics. Aesthetics stands for the study of beauty and regarding that Kumar Swami has some very important <coughs> statements to make. So I will look into that and then I will also go into the, the goal of art. 
when should there be art what should be the art the goal of artists in their works of art and finally on art as yoga i will touch upon only these three points <clears throat> in fact the amount of material that kumar somi has produced he is he turns to something like 1000 articles and books that he has written and it's very difficult to collect them all and present in a nutshell in a matter of an hour or two so one may require a series of lectures regarding this issue now the the word aesthetics is regularly used as a study of the science of beauty but kumar swami has a, a great objection to the use of the very word aesthetics he says any study of traditional art should begin by discarding the term aesthetics altogether and that is because he goes into the very etymology of the word aesthetics and he shows how aesthesis the greek word from which this word derives refers to the physical affectability as distinguished from mental operations and the as the word itself is hardly very old aesthetics in this sense of the study of beauty does not go back to more than 18th century doesn't go beyond that so it's only after the 18th century that this word has come into vogue and kumar swami has shown that aesthesis has much to do with only sensation and what caters to merely the enjoyment through our sense organs is something very limited and something very ordinary one has to go deep into the meaning of what is represented and therefore he says it is better to avoid this term aesthetics though it has gained acceptance generally kumar swami has shown how the very approach itself is symptomatic of the limitation that artists today have and how they have not gone to the possibilities of the depths of the appreciation of art he refers to the purposiveness of art whatever man does should be something that caters to both levels namely the psycho physical being our body and mind and also the spiritual level so it's only when these two are simultaneously covered that it could be called good art because they cover to the entirety of the person of man and not merely to please his sense organs so producing mere sweet sounds cannot be called art that's only a very primitive level of making mere pleasing sounds on the other hand what should it lead to that need is something very clearly perceived and presented by amdukma song in the modern usage of the term art has become rather purposeless on the other hand kumar swami shows how even in plato a need or indigence is the first cause of the production of art he says so what exactly are the needs of man if you take man as a mere physical being it doesn't go deep enough at all and therefore ultimately it must cater to even the spiritual needs of man so he says art is the making well of whatever needs making just as ethics is the right way of doing things so what things ought to be done what things are not to be done there is something right about it something wrong about it this must be decided first so this is taken care of by ethics similarly what is the right way of doing it and wrong way of doing it this is taken care of by art he speaks of the what is called the vocation the word vocation means calling so it is as though a person is called by nature to take up some work now the first feature of this is that the person 
enjoys what he is doing and he doesn't need any working hours for doing what he does. You can contrast this with the modern lifestyle. So just if you could only compare to what India was, say even up to say some 25 years ago, 50 years ago, the kind of life that the various kinds of artists led in our villages, the kind of satisfaction that they would derive in doing their work, compared to the kind of boredom that modern, see, a factory worker today in, uh, in modern times has. <clears throat> he said, Kumar Swami says, the craftsman likes talking about his handicraft. The workman, the modern industrial worker, likes talking about the ball game. In other words, he doesn't really enjoy his work. He doesn't love his work. Vocation is when you are called to do this work. The word vocation is from a, a Latin root, so which is also connected to the Sanskrit root. So root which is to speak, to call, and therefore you will, we must do such work in life as we really enjoy. And that is where you can do the work to your satisfaction. So happiness today, he points out, is in getting away from work and being at play. What Kumar Swami points out is that a true artist is a person who loves his work and is so totally absorbed in it that he doesn't need see, specific working hours and specific leisure hours. Culture, Kumar Swami points out, is not something that we pursue during our leisure hours. That is not the case. It is not during play and leisure hours that we pursue culture, but all through our work. So, if you are doing something, he says, our hankering for a state of leisure is the proof of the fact that most of us are working at a task which we could never have been called by anyone but a salesman, certainly not by God or by our own natures. So when you are working in a factory, when you are working, say, in a, an IT company, okay, it is not that you so love your work that you would like to work the more and the more. On the other hand, there is a boss who demands some work from you and extract the maximum out of you. And it's only because you get paid that you would like to work that hard. On the other hand, in the case of a typical craftsman in India, he would love the work so much that he would be totally absorbed in it. <clears throat> Here Kumar Swami brings in the concept of what is called Swakarma, which is detailed in the Bhagavad Gita also. So when a person does a work that he loves the most, it also becomes a matter of worship. In the Bhagavad Gita it is said, Swakarmana tamabhyarchya siddhyam vindati manava and therefore that is Swakarman by which you, <clears throat> you cater to the spiritual need as well as the physical need simultaneously. So Kumar Swami says, it is here that you can find the coincidence of beauty and utility significance and attitude. Another point Kumar Swami makes is that the, the philosophy today of art for art's sake is something never accepted. All works of art are taken up with certain ends in mind, with certain goals in view. Now, for this, he gives examples from the Buddhist literature and even some of the <coughs> Western literature. He cites, for example, uh, the work of Ashokosha, mm. his work called Saundarananda, which details the life of the Buddha. But towards the end, he says, Ityesha vipashanta ye narata ye mokshartha garbha shotriyunam grahanartha manya manasam kavyobacharatkrita Yen mokshatkrita manyadatra himayatat kavya dharmatkritam patum diktam yomshadham madhitam hrityam katham syaditi. He says, This work I wrote not for mere enjoyment as poetry. 
for it is only a mode and a means and ultimately the way of release from the bondages of life need to be illustrated through this work of art and therefore he says the goal of his work is that Dante says the whole work was undertaken for a practical end to remove those who are living in this life from the state of wretchedness and to lead them to the state of blessedness so the goal of all noble works of art is such in our own heritage there is a concept of what are called three samhitas namely prabhu samhita vidya samhita and kanta samhita the vedic literature is called prabhu samhita there the utterances of the vedas are like a king's commands that's called prabhu samhita the wordings in the puranas are like a friend's advice is called mitra samhita and a work of poetry as of kalidasa is called kanta samhita like the sweet words of a beloved where without active actually asking him to do a certain thing or not asking him to do a certain thing the wife is able to convey the message so of what is to be done and what is not to be done and therefore like the loving words of a beloved wife the kavya urges man to engage himself in the right activity and eschew all wrong activity kumar swami has another sutra there are many sutra like statements he says the artist is not a special kind of man on the other hand every man every man is necessarily some special kind of artist what does this mean he says see in in the modern situation we find artists enjoying special privileges they have the freedom to express anything and there is nothing to bind them or hinder them in the wildness of their imagination and in the name of art they do many nonsense things and especially in our own context in the indian context in the under the 